Hello, I'm Lawrence and I'm on a quest to uncover all of the memos that Britain and America lost in the pond and one of those memos pertains to grammar. Despite spending many years on this channel talking about the numerous word spelling and pronunciation differences between our two countries, grammatical differences always seem like they'd be really hard to talk about just because there are so many large technical words involved. And then I remembered, not only have I lived extensively in both Britain and America, but I also have a degree in English language, albeit a second class honours degree. They all count. And so throughout this video you'll be hearing some of those big words like auxiliary verb and past participle. They don't really mean anything. All that matters for this video is the examples that I'm going to give. But before I do that, if you're the sort of person who likes to learn about the differences between Britain and America and you haven't had a chance to subscribe to this channel, do that now! The first one is how we use determiners. And I know what you're thinking, ooh, Lawrence, what is a determiner? Well, a determiner is usually a short word like the, a or an that goes before a noun to help us understand certain properties of that noun. So for example, if I said I had a lint roller, you might say, well, me too. There are plenty of those in the world. But if I said I had the lint roller, you might assume that it's the last one in existence, which would leave my cat truly mortified. And so that brings us on very neatly to hospitals. <laughs> This isn't. A, this is my spare bedroom made to look like a hospital from the 1940s for the purposes of storytelling. But if I were to have a medical problem such as appendicitis or an arrow through my cheek, I might end up in hospital. And you notice how I didn't even use a determiner there. And that might sound cavalier to Americans, especially the ones that often bombard my comment section with, why do British people say in hospital and not in the hospital? And then I thought about this and realized that if you switch the word hospital for say the word prison, America Americans would do the same as the British in that circumstance. You wouldn't say Uncle Toby is in the prison, you'd say Uncle Toby is in prison and deserves it. Similarly, in Britain, proud parents might say that my son and or daughter is at university. And lo and behold, in America, they would also say my son and or daughter is at, u is at college. It is slightly different, but for different reasons. I suppose one thing to note about a hospital visit versus the other examples that I just gave is that in theory, you don't expect to stay in hospital for a long time. So maybe that's a way of Americans just euphemizing that. Is euphemizing a word? Making hospital visits just that little bit less scary. Hello, I'm just editing this video as I film it. You may have noticed that I'm wearing a sports shirt. And I'm doing that because just like with the hospital, it helps to support my narrative. Because the world of sports throws up a lot of differences between Britain and America, sports being one of them. In Britain, we would usually say sport. But you've got soccer versus football, cleats versus football boots, and baseball versus cricket. They're two different sports. Right. But of course, these are all word differences. When it comes to the grammar of sports, there's one place in particular that the two countries completely and utterly a little bit diverge, and that is collective nouns. And a collective noun is a noun that describes more than one thing within a collective. So the army or the jury or the England national football team. And the major difference comes in how we count that noun. In Britain, the England national football team is a plural collective noun. So when discussing them, we'd say England are a world-class football team. But things are slightly different in America where the England national football team becomes a singular collective noun. And so something I hear all the time is, England is an average soccer team, which, and I don't usually do this, is just incorrect English. We are a world-class football team. All right, past participles. Do we have to talk about them? Right, yep. Yeah. We do. So wake up class. A past participle is a form of a verb that is used to form the perfect and passive tenses. Do you see why I only got second class? Right, so an example of a past participle is a word like broken, being the past participle of the word break. So for example, in 2023, Lost in the Pond has seen a lot of viewing records broken. It's true. That wasn't the official example I was going to use to highlight how Britain and America are so very different on this subject. Instead, if you are still awake at this point, I'd like to talk about the past participle of the word get. In Britain, this is represented by the word got. Let me show you an example. I'm Lawrence and I haven't got any better at the ukulele. 
I also said ukulele. Whereas here, in this context, Americans would use the word gotten. And the American way makes some British people mad. But when you think about it, there is a little bit of logic to it, especially when you consider the past participle of the word forget. Nobody in England would say Lawrence has forgot how to play the ukulele. Actually, they might. But formally speaking, people are supposed to say Lawrence has forgotten how to play the ukulele. Notice, gotten, forgotten. I'm not saying either way is wrong. I'm just saying that if we want consistency with our past participles, America might be on the right track. And also gotten is a word I've picked up since moving to America, so I'm getting defensive. But one thing that I haven't let go of is British auxiliary verbs. And I know that that sounds like a military unit, but it's not. An auxiliary verb is known more commonly as a helping verb. It helps other verbs. It's really not its kind. An example of an auxiliary verb is the word am in I am speaking. But if you don't have am, the word speaking feels helpless. I speaking, what does that mean? Nothing. So auxiliary verbs, while boring, are very important. And this is true in both Britain and America. It's just that sometimes the two countries don't use auxiliary verbs in quite the same way. Take, for example, the following sentence. Lawrence, you needn't mow the yard every single day. And as you can see, that is advice that I followed. But that's a sentence that you're more likely to hear in Britain where the auxiliary verb needn't is still more prominent. In America, somebody like my wife might say, Lawrence, you don't need to mow the lawn every day. But the British one is marginally quicker to type, so I give that one the thumbs up. Now, I know I'm asking a lot of you to keep up with this, but unfortunately we've now moved on to modal verbs. It's cheaper than melatonin. So altogether, at the back of the class, unless you already know the answer, I want you to shout out, what is a modal verb, Lawrence? Can't hear, oh, you're not actually here. Well, a modal verb is a type of auxiliary verb that expresses either a possibility or a necessity. So an example, I could get ukulele lessons is a possibility. Or if I was to say, I shall get ukulele lessons, that would suggest that ukulele lessons are a necessity in my life. And it's actually that that I wanna talk about right now, not my life, but the word shall. In England, every now and again, we still have this propensity for talking like we are characters in a Jane Austen novel. So why say will and will not when you can say shall and shall not, shallant, is that, that's not a word, look that up. Shallant is not a word, but shan't is a word. How did I forget that? I shan't be going back to England any time soon with any dignity. So a pretty good example is I'm a Lost in the Pond subscriber and I shall buy one of Lawrence's t-shirts that he designed all himself. It was that like two on the notes, wasn't it? Have I sold out? Whereas Americans would say I will buy one of Lawrence's t-shirts that he designed himself by going to the Pondland link in the description below. Now, don't get me wrong, in Britain, we do also use the word will in this same context. In fact, I would say that more British people do that than use the word shall, but I think pound for pound, more British people say shall than Americans do. I wrote a dissertation and every, you can't believe it, can you? Anyway, back to Lawrence in the garden. And finally, the past continuous tense. And I know that that sounds like a lot of syllables for this time on a Wednesday, but it's a tense that we use all of the time when talking about something that happened in the past, using the present participle of the ing verb. Did you get any of that? Basically, an example is, I was filming this video. I was is in the past, but filming is a present participle. Don't worry about any of that, because for the most part, British and American English agrees what to do on this particular tense, except when we're talking about standing and sitting. 20 years ago, when I was studying A-level English, my English teacher told me, Lawrence, there is one form of the past continuous tense that British people routinely get wrong. And that's when they say something like, I was sat in my yard, or, I was stood in my yard. He told me right there and then that the correct usage was I was standing in my yard and I've just realised you can't see my head. So I was also sitting in my yard. Well, lo and behold, upon moving to the United States, I discovered that for their part, Americans followed my English teacher's advice. Did you all know him? In other words, Americans do say I am sitting in my yard or I am, st you get the picture. And this is a case where I don't really care who says what, it's just that the grammar establishment would say that Americans are correct on this issue. And I've just realized that British people are more likely to say garden than yard. Nobody really bothers with bar chords, do they? 
Anyway, that's it for this episode. I'm Lawrence Brown. You can follow me on Twitter and also threads. And don't forget to subscribe to this channel so that I don't have to. If you like it when I talk about the English language, here's me discussing five American accents that I really like, a video that you're going to watch next. This video, just like all of the ones that I do, was made possible by my ponderers. If you would like to become a ponderer and get access to my secret video series, Diary of a YouTube Sensation, you can do so by clicking the join button below or by becoming a patron at patreon.com slash lost in the pond. Until the next video, goodbye.